I hope today's message truly inspires and motivates you to become the best you that you can be for God today. We believe that when you elevate your thinking, you elevate your life. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure to hit subscribe, and we look forward to taking this journey with you. We'll see you soon. The title of my message today is Don't Lose It. Everybody say, Don't Lose It. Look at your neighbor and say, Don't Lose It. And uh, I want to give you a thought today. Our scripture of the year that God gave us was found in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. I love this. God gave us a word. The word for 2024 was the word more. Uh, for 2024, it's a year of more. More what? More freedom. More revelation. More impartation. Uh, more health. More resources. Come on. How, how, many know, how many know that God can do anything? Look at this. God can do anything. Far more. You know what, you know what, you know what the limitation of God is? It's our far more. What's your far more for God? Some of us, we put God in a box. Sometimes we, we, li we limit God. Can I just tell you something? Don't you dare take far more on a human thought process and think that's all that God can do. God can do beyond what you can do. Come on, he's God. Are you with me? Look at this. He can do far more than you could ever imagine, guess, or request in your wildest dreams. I want you to look at this scripture. This scripture is a scripture that the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians uh, for, I think this is pretty powerful. This is uh, Philippians 3, verse 14. I, I want you to know about the book of Philippians. It's a book of encouragement. It's a book that Paul wrote when he was in prison, and it's a book of winning. It really is. If you study the book, it's a book of encouragement, and it's a book of winning. Let me just tell you, I know I'm new. I've been here 20 months. Uh, we're getting ready in September to celebrate two years as a church, two years as a church. And I want to encourage you on something, family. Our heart for you, our heart for you as a pastoral team, as elders of our church, as leaders of our church, our heart for you is that we want you to win. Uh, we want you to win so, I, I think we want, to, we want you to win so badly. We want you to win in the game of life. You know, sometimes you can be a Christian and not win. Sometimes you can go to church and go to church and go to church, but not really win. How many know that God wants you to win? God wants you to win. I, I, I want to encourage you. God wants you to win. Some people don't have a winning men mentality, a winning mindset. I just want to encourage you. God wants you to win. Know that about God. He wants you to win. God wants you to win. That's why he said you're more than a conqueror. You're more than a champion. That's why he said you'll be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. That's why the Bible says that whatever you do, it shall prosper. God wants you to win. I love what the Apostle Paul said here. He said this. I'm just taking this one verse in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. He goes, I press towards the mark, the prize, the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. Let me go ahead and just stop for a second and give you a couple handles real quick. I want you to look at this word right here, press. I want, you to look at, I want you to look at mark, and I want you to look at prize, and then I want you to look at high calling. There's three simple words I want you to really look at. Or excuse me, four words I want you to look at. And uh, in these four words, you can find these four words in this place today. Church, I want you to hear me real quick. This place matters. Why does it matter? Because it's a church? No, it's, church is not a building. The church is a group of people. This place matters. Every place I've been to on my 40-year journey as a believer has mattered in my journey of development and maturity. Every place that you're connected to, that you're a part of, God wants to impart something to you to help you grow and go to another level. Every place that you're connected to matters. When I get with the right people in the right place at the right time, the right things happen in my life. If I get with the wrong people at the wrong place at the wrong time, then the wrong things happen. So in order for the right things to happen, how many know i got to be with the right people? How many know people matter? Your reference group matters, who I spend time with. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57 says, bad company, guess what? It corrupts good morals. It leads you, misleads you into wrong places. So what am I trying to say? Uh, in my journey, I remember growing up and I got radically saved. That means God came in my life and changed my life. This was in Detroit, Michigan in St. John's Assembly. Then we left uh, St. John's Assembly and we went to Riverdale Assembly. Then we left Riverdale Assembly and then we went to Church on the Move in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Then out of Church on the Move, we went to Victory Christian Center. Out of Victory Christian Center, I traveled the world with a group called the Power Team, John Jacobs and the Power Team, for 14 years. I traveled around the world. And I was a full-time evangelist traveling literally around the globe, 42 different countries, 
Every place I've been, then from that place, led me to another place in Frisco, Texas. Everywhere I've been on my 28-year journey in full-time ministry has had a major impact in my life. So let me just say something to you. Some of you might be here today saying, I don't know if this place really matters. I know I'm supposed to go to church. If you think that it doesn't matter, you won't ever get anything from it. But if you know that God has you here, planted for a season, maybe for a reason, maybe for a lifetime, whatever God wants to do, how me know that you can get something out of the place that God has you planted? That's why the Bible says in Psalms 92, uh, says those who are planted in the house of God will flourish. It doesn't say those who attend church one time a year will flourish. It doesn't say those who are sporadic in their attendance will flourish. It doesn't say those who are transplanted will flourish. It says those who are planted in the house of God will flourish. How many know if we're going to flourish, how many know we got to be planted? You can have a great seed of potential, but if you don't put the seed in good soil, the soil, if I don't take a good seed and put it in good soil, then guess what? The seed will never have its full potential come to fruition. God wants us to grow and develop spiritually. God wants us to go next level. Is this helping you this morning? So I want to I want to make sure because every place matters. This place matters. This might be a season of your life where God speaks to you and develops some things in you and gives you some more tools in your toolbox to help you fulfill the destiny that's in your life. So what we got to do is here when we look at this scripture right here, the Apostle Paul is saying this: I press, I press. Uh, a lot of people don't know how to press. There's really two different types of people. Let me just show you real quick. I mean, I'm going to back up, so let me use this cool technology board and try to be, try to be cool. But let me show you something. You, you got press, mark, prize, and high calling. The word press means to extend maximum effort. Let me ask you a question this morning. As a Christ follower, as a New Testament disciple, as a believer in Jesus, as a Christian, are you maximizing your effort for God? Are you pressing towards God? How many know you can press towards God and you can press away from God? Okay, don't be quiet on me, church. You, 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 you can press one way, the culture's way, the world's way, or you can press the kingdom's way, God's way. And a lot of times we find ourselves on Sundays pressing God's way. Then we find ourselves on Monday pressing the world's way. Then we find ourselves Tuesday pressing our way. Then we find ourselves on Thursday, guess what, doing whatever someone else's way is. And then what happens is we wonder why our life doesn't go like this. Our life goes like this. I'm telling you something, as a believer, this is theologically, theologically sound. As a believer, God wants you to win in life. Not just when you get to heaven, but on this side of eternity, God wants you to win. God wants you to win. God made you to be a winner. But here's the deal. If you don't know how to press, you won't be in the winner's circle. If you're going to get in the winner's circle, there's going to have to be a press. There's going to have to be a push. Watch this. In order to really win in life, you're going to have to press towards the mark. The word press means all in, maximum effort. The word mark means like I've got this purpose, this destiny. I've got this point of view. I've got this point of reference that I'm going towards. I've got this mark. Can I help you real quick, church? Listen to me. Every one of us, every day we should get up in the morning and we should spend time with Jesus. Every day we get up, we should say, God, thank you for waking me up today. Thank you for giving me a great day. Matter of fact, let me give you my top ten things I say every morning. Are you ready? Here we go. Number one, God, thank you for waking me up today. Number two, God, thank you for waking me up today. Number three, God, thank you for waking me up today. Number four, God, thank you for waking me up today. Number five, God, thank you for waking me up today. Number six, God, thank you for waking me up today. Number seven, God, thank you for waking me up today. Number eight, God, thank you for waking me up today. Number nine, God, thank you for waking me up today. And here it is, number 10, God, thank you for waking me up today. Let me just help you. Let me help you. Some of you, when's the last time you said thank you? How many know when you lose your thanksgiving, you lose your faith? Faith and thanksgiving are connected. I got to be thankful so my faith can sustain. God, thank you for waking me up. 
thank you I got rightness in mind. Because I've been through some stuff in my life that my mind could have been scattered. I've been through some stuff in my life that I could have lost hope along the journey. I've been through some stuff in my life where I could have threw the towel in and walked away from the church and walked away from God. But thank God for his mercy and his grace that's kept me going every day of my life. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not saying it's going to be a cakewalk. I'm not going to say it's going to be high fives and holy hugs. But what I am saying is there's a press that if you'll press, guess what you'll do? You'll see the mark that God has for you. And if you'll stay focused, guess what's going to happen? You'll hit the prize. See, a lot of people don't think there's a prize in serving God. There's a prize. The Bible says that God's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. There is a, oh, church, I got the favor of God on my life. And the very fact... (laughs) <laughs> the very fact that I got the favor of God, that means whoever's around me got the favor of God. And the very fact that you got the favor of God, that means whoever's around you got the favor of God. And see, some, some of you, some of you, you don't, you, don't, you don't believe that about yourself. So therefore, you never experience favor. I got favor. What, what do you mean? I got favor because God loves me. Because I was destined to a place called hell, but by his grace, God reached down and said, no, son. I got you. Hell had you, but now heaven's got you. This is, this, is a big, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. This is a big deal. Because here's the deal. There's a press. Watch this. Then there's a mark, a point of reference. i got to keep my eyes focused. Some of us are drifting. You know why they put guardrails over bridges? So you don't go off the bridge. You know why there's church? So you can stay on the right road. You know why there's community? So you can get with some other brothers and sisters that will encourage you and build you up and help you win in the game of life. You know why we got guardrails in church? You know why we got to follow God's principles and not man's principles? You know why we got to live God's way and not man's way? Because they are guardrails to help us keep our focus on the mark. Watch this. Then there's a prize. What's the ultimate prize? The Zoe life. The Zoe life, the the God more than abundant life. See, some of you, you're just surviving. Can I just encourage you? Surviving is not God's best life for you. Surviving is not God's best for you. God wants you to win. God wants you to thrive and not just survive. Some of you have been sinking. You know why you've been sinking? Let me encourage you why you've been sinking. Because you're missing the mark. You're not pressing towards the right direction. And that's when we find ourselves sinking. That's why the Bible says, count it joy, my brothers and sisters, when you go through various trials, don't lose hope. Don't you dare quit. Why, why do people quit? Because they start wavering what the mark is going to be. And they think the world has a better prize than what God has. But then there's a high calling. What's the high calling? If you study scripture, the high calling of a believer is to be a servant of God. In Matthew chapter 18, the disciples are sitting around and they're saying, who's the best? Who's the best disciple? Is it me, Bartholomew? (laughs) Is it me, Peter? Is it me, John? Who's the best disciple? And Jesus said, no, 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 no. You guys are missing it. And he grabs a little child by the hand. And he says, unless you humble yourself like a child, you won't be fit for the kingdom of heaven. What is he saying? Unless you come in low. See, a lot of times we talk about platforms, but we don't talk about the pavement. Let me help you. The platform I stand on today was built in the pavement many years ago. Okay, let me help you. I, I, I don't just have a platform because one day I woke up and said I got a gift for a platform. No, the platform was developed when I was knocking on doors when I was 19 years old, picking up kids in a bus ministry, bringing them to Saturday morning church, knocking on doors in the inner city complex, handing out Tootsie Rolls and flyers 20-something years ago. That's where the pavement, that's where the development was. That's where the platform was starting to be birthed that God wanted to use me. But guess where it started? It started outside of the church, being a voice for him, being a tool for him, being a living stone for him. It started outside of the church. God used my life. Every place I've ever been mattered. That was a place of development for three years every Friday night. We only had one Saturday off. That was Christmas weekend. For three years every Friday night, I'd be knocking on doors. Hey, Pastor Jay's here. They used to call me, I, got, I won't tell you my nickname. They used to call me Big Red. <laughs> 
I used to say, Big Red is here, and in the Spanish folk, Grande Rojo is here, Grande Rojo is here. And, 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 and I used to walk through the neighborhood, knocking on doors, Big Red is here, I got some Tootsie Rolls for you. And <laughs> I ate a lot of Tootsie Rolls, I know y'all can tell. But here's the deal. Uh, and I used to pass out flyers. Hey, tomorrow morning, 8.30 in the morning, the bus is going to be here. We're going to pick up you, your brother, your sister, your mama. We're going to give your mama a free bag of groceries. We're going to pick you up on the school bus. And guess what? There were 60 buses that went out throughout the city. And I was so proud of myself because I was 19 years old and I was a bus captain. Bus captain. A bus captain. I wasn't a pastor. I wasn't an elder or a deacon. I wasn't running some big department in the church. I was a bus captain. And I wore that badge proudly. We had a little lanyard and it said bus captain. And sometimes you had to flip it back over so everybody knew who I was. Because they only printed one side because we was on a budget back then. <laughs> no, that's a real story. Okay, so, so I, I let everybody know I'm a bus captain. It was a great accomplishment in my life, but that place developed something on the pavement that God gave me a platform to speak. Sometimes we want platforms with missing the work, the press of development. If you get a platform too early, then you'll have a position that you're not ready for, and it can do damage in someone's life as you lead them. I got to get off that. <laughs> this is so important. Here, 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 let me go back. Uh, I'm going to go back because I missed something. I want you to see this. You, you, have you ever noticed there's two types of people in the world? Here it is. Number one, those that let their circumstances influence their enthusiasm are number two. Those who use their enthusiasm to influence their circumstances. Really listen to me. The, the, the passion I have today did not start when I became a pastor of Elevate Life Church. This is the same passion I had November the 14th, 1984, when Jesus changed my life. When I was a little boy and I walked down an aisle and I stood before the preacher and I gave my life to Christ. It's the same passion today. Has it been refined? Oh, yeah. Has it been developed? Yes. Has it matured? Yes. There's a lot more maturity that has to come. But thank God I'm not, I'm not something that I wasn't used to be. Thank God the passion has grown every single year. The enthusiasm has grown every year. What am I trying to say? Sometimes you can start strong. And you can finish weak. But how many know God wants you to start strong and finish strong? You, you, you look at this. I'm going to use my enthusiasm, my, my passion, my zeal. I'm going to use my life to glorify Jesus. This is such a big deal. The word enthusiasm comes from two words. In theos. Theos is, 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 is the theory, uh, theology. It's a Greek word that we get theology out of. It's two words, uh, enthusiasm is two words, in theos, which means, theos means this, which means in God, filled with God. You ever met a joyful person? You ever met somebody that's so positive that you just wanted to smack them? <laughs> Maybe that's just, like, I'm, I'm positive now, like I'm really positive. But if you're more positive than me, I, I just like, mm, mm. But they tapped into something I haven't tapped into yet. They matured in some stuff I haven't matured in yet. Why? Because when you're filled with God, you ever met somebody that's really on fire for God? They're so joyful. Have you ever met somebody that's really on fire for God? Man, they're so positive. They're so joyful. They got a skip in their step, a smile on their face. Hey, the building's on fire. It's okay. No big deal. We got insurance. <laughs> like, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the building's on fire. It's okay. Everybody's out. Come on. You ever met somebody like that? Uh, I, I, my friend Ben, my friend Ben the other day, he was talking to me the other day. He's like, man, we had a day, and, he, and I won't go into the story, but he had a day. He goes like, I was so proud of myself. And I said, what happened, Ben? He goes, I kept my cool. And I said, Ben, I'm proud of you. Because he told me the story that happened. Now, I'm not going to tell him his family business in front of all y'all. <laughs> but but it, if that would have happened to me, I'm like, mm. I might have, I might have lost it just <laughs> a little bit. You, you, come on, you, you ever met somebody like that? Why? Because something on the inside of them is filled with the joy and the love of God. That God has filled their spirit. That they're so positive. You, have you ever met a Christian that was negative? 
You ever met a Christian that had crunch face? See, some of y'all don't know that. That was a thing I used for the first year here. Because everybody I met that said they were a believer, they looked like this. I'm like, like, what's wrong with these people up here? I'm from Dallas. At least we say God bless you. Hallelujah. Everybody up here like mad, angry. Like crunch face. I mean, just crunch face. You know, like, like let's have RBF, resting blessed face. You know what I'm saying? Let's say, let, see, some of y'all are in the world too long. Y'all need to get saved. That's the problem. Y'all need to get saved. See, y'all listen to the world. But here's the deal. You, you got to understand, God's blessed you. God's woke you up. Where's the enthusiasm in your life? Where's the joy, the skip, the, the smile? Come on, God is on the throne. Don't be worrying about everything in this world. There's a kingdom that's beyond this world. Let's have some joy. I, I love this. The great apostle Paul said this, but thanks God. But thanks, thank God. He gives us victory over sin and death, our Lord Jesus Christ. I love this part. So my brothers and sisters, I, I just think that belongs in church. I, I wish I could preach like that. So my brothers and sisters, be strong, immovable. Some of you are so movable because you are not enthusiastic about the Lord. When you get enthusiastic about the Lord, you're not going to be that easily movable. Watch this. Always having what? Always work now, I didn't put this in the Bible. Some of us need to be very enthusiastically for the Lord. We need to get that thing. Go- Watch this. For the Lord, for you know that nothing you do in the Lord is ever useless. It's not what you do that makes the meaningful, but it's who you do it for. What are we doing this thing for? We're not doing this thing so that some one person's name can be great. We're doing this for God so that Jesus can get all the glory while we live on this side of eternity so that we can make heaven more crowded and make disciples that follow Jesus. That's our mission statement as a church. This church is a hospital for the hurting, the poor, the desperate, the dying. This is a place that we gather together and we sharpen each other. We encourage each other. We look at each other and say, you are a winner. You are more than a conqueror. God's got something special for you. You're going to make it. Your best days are still before you. God's got your back. God's got your side. God's got your front. God's for. But, but, but here's the deal. If we're not careful, if we're not careful, we'll go into man's tradition and we'll find ourselves being religious and we'll find ourselves trying to put constraints on what God's going to do through us and in us. Some of us think we're unqualified to be used by God. God's grace and God's mercy is there for you to be used by God. God wants to use your life. You ain't got to have it all together just yet. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, you guess what? You can invite someone to church. You can serve at the door. You can be in the parking lot. You can, you can, you can help set up. You can help tear down. You can start somewhere on the journey of faith, and God can use your life. And then guess what? When you get it with the right people, something is transferred. Let me tell you about this guy right here. This guy, Mike, he's from Austin, Texas. He moved here about a year and a half ago, two years ago. Back and forth, he traveled. Him and his wife, Kelly, have been married for 22 years. Beautiful couple right here. They, they were on the front page of Wallingford's Most Finest. And so, so, so <laughs> why are you laughing about that? That's my family. So, so he moved here from Austin, Texas. He can, he can cook the best barbecue ever. When I first met Mike, I'm like, bro, what's, what's, this, guy, what's this guy's deal? Because Mike was so positive. He's like, hey, man. <laughs> if you ever talk to him like this, how Mike is, hey. That's a great message today, man. I got four pages. No, that was great. I'm like, I'm like, okay, cool, dude. Thanks, man. God bless you. Next week, hey. <laughs> that was awesome. If you get around Mike, what Mike carries will jump on you, and you'll be walking around, hey. (laughs) And people are like, what's wrong with that guy? What's wrong with that gal? No, this is the kind of people you want to be around. Mike, Mike grabbed my heart, but then he grabbed my spirit. And I thought, Mike is going to be one of my favorite guys that I get to spend my life with in Connecticut. And Mike has been by my side ever since. And every time we just had our first service, Mike was up saying, he was like, hey. Mike is so encouraging. Even though Mike has his own journey, 
But when you see Mike, you see the love of God pour out of his heart. That's what a believer, that's what the fruit of a believer. It's not, it's not that we say we're Christians. It's people know that we're Christians by the way we live our life. Francis Assisi said this, use words at all time. No, he, he, said, he said, yeah, use words at all time. If necessary, speak. What is he saying? You use, I messed the quote up. How'd it go? Man, I need some help on the front row, man. You guys. <laughs> what did he say? Come on, anybody here? Come on, come on. Preach the word at all times. And if necessary, there you go, Kelly. Help a brother out up here. If necessary, use words. What is he saying? This is Francis of Sisi is saying this. He said, let your life speak. Let your life speak of the love of Jesus, enthusiasm. Watch this, watch this, watch this. This is so important. David, you know, you know David, the shepherd boy. You know David who fought the giant. You know David who killed the bear. You know David who killed the lion. Anybody know David? Come on, y'all been in church long enough, you know David? David, guess what he did every day? Every day David, when he was a little boy, he trusted God. Every day David walked with God. Every day David worshiped God. Then you see in this story in Second and First Samuel chapter seventeen, you read the you read this story and you can see with your own eyes the confidence, the enthusiasm that David shares out of his heart. Look at this. David said to the Philistine, "Look at the enthusiasm. Look at the passion. Look at the zeal. Look at the fire. Look at David not letting the circumstance control his life, but David's going to control the circumstances with his life because God has done something on the inside." Watch this. David said to the Philistine. You come against me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This is a young shepherd boy, 15, 16 years old. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I will strike you down and cut off your head. This day I will give your carcass of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. And the world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered, watch this here, all those gathered here will know that there is not a sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you all of you into our hands. This is King David, listen, this is the shepherd boy. This is the enthusiasm, the passion, the zeal. The fire. This is him. Watch this. This is him knowing, knowing that there's a press, knowing that there's a mark, knowing that there's a high prize, knowing that there's a reward. Guess what? This is this is David. Watch this. Watch this. Somewhere along David's journey, though, he got comfortable. David, look at the confidence. Look at the confidence that he says. Look at the enthusiasm that he's sharing this against the Philistines. He's a little teenager. And he's sharing with such passion. Then if you study the scripture, you see that David along his journey, watch this. David along his journey started losing his way. Where do we see that? We see that all through Samuel. We see that in 2 Samuel where David should have been at battle, should have been at war. Instead in him going to war in the fall, David stayed home because he got comfortable. Now watch this. When David stayed home while his men were fighting... David walked on the roof, and he saw something that he shouldn't have saw that led him down a life that he should not have been le living. When he got on the roof, he saw this woman named Bathsheba. Bathsheba, she was on the roof, and she was, she was, she was taking a shower. And David saw that she was beautiful. David is married, and David's looking at a, another woman. David should have been in the battle fighting with his men, but David got comfortable, he got complacent, he got satisfied with his walk with the Lord, even though that David trusted in God daily, he walked with God daily, he worshiped God daily, the key word there is daily, he did it daily, how many know Jesus can be a mascot or he can be your Messiah? If you just show up to church and you only serve him on Sunday, I'm going to help you family, he's a mascot, he's not your Messiah. Because when he's your Messiah, you don't just follow him to church on Sunday. You live for him every single day of your life. You serve God every day of your life. You go after him every day of your life. This is such a big deal. This is why we got to be such a people group that are on the push, on the press, to saying, God, develop me, grow me, help me mature. Watch this. This is so important. Spiritual enthusiasm is born out of spending time with God. 
David trusted God daily, walked with God daily, worshiped God daily. But then we find David doing some things he shouldn't have done. David is on the roof looking at a woman who's not his wife. I hope your children are in kids' church. Because <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to keep it PG. I'll keep it PG. So, so, so he's looking, and because he was not at battle, he got comfortable and complacent in his walk with God. Now he found himself what I call drifting, losing enthusiasm, losing passion, losing fire for God, losing the commitment, losing the zeal. Are you with me? And then David fell into great sin. Matter of fact, David had her husband killed on the battlefield. Not only did David commit adultery, but David also, watch this, David also committed murder. So now we find David at the course of his life. When he was a young man, man, he was on fire for God. But somewhere along the journey, he stopped trusting God daily. He stopped spending time with God daily. He stopped praying daily. He stopped worshiping daily. Now we find David on this journey as a king in so much turmoil. Make a long story short, David has to get it together. The prophet Nathaniel spoke to David that God spoke to him. And then this is when David penned these words. He penned these words in Psalms 51. This is what David said. He said this to God. He repented. Repent means the turn of your way. It means you're going one direction. It means to literally do a 180 turn and go back the other direction. He repents. Watch this. This is what David said. This is what the King David said. The shepherd boy. The one who fought the lion. The one who fought the bear. The one who defeated the Goliath. This is what David said. After he made so many mistakes. Here's what David said. God, create in me a pure heart. Oh, God, a renewed, steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain, to sustain me. This is so important. This is where we got to come back to the Father, not coming back here at this level, but we're coming in low saying, God, created me a clean heart. Forgive me. I'm going to get back up. I'm going after you. I thank you for your grace and your mercy today. God, I missed it, but guess what? There's mercy and grace at the cross. So David, he started strong, and in the middle of his life, he started missing it. But at the end of his life, the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. Can I just tell you something, church? Don't lose your enthusiasm. Look at this scripture I'm going to close today. I hope you're getting something out of this. It's hot. <sighs> Thank you for that. So um, when, I think about, when I think about Jesus and I think about the story of Mark 1, this is what I look at. I want you to look at this story. Very early in the morning... While, Jesus, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place where he prayed. Everybody look at me real quick. You see this in the, in the book of Mark. We find this in Mark 6, 14, and 15 where Jesus got away and he prayed. If Jesus, the Son of God, got away and prayed to the Father, how much more should me and you pray to the Father? Okay, okay, I'm a <laughs> okay, I'm gonna say it again. How many know it's not about coming to church, it's about being the church, but spending time with the one that created the church. So, so so here's the question today, and here's the question. Here's the question I want to ask you: where is your secret place? Is your secret place on the commute to your work? Are you talking to God, praying to God? Do you have a secret place in your home? I have a home office, that's my secret place. Uh, uh, sometimes when I want to switch it up, I go down into my gym in my basement. I have a, I have a full-blown gym down there. And I go down there and I just sit on the work uh, the bench. and I haven't touched weights in a long time, but I sit down there. That's a whole other story. <laughs> just because you're around something doesn't mean you want to do it. You know what I'm saying? So see, I told you I'm on the journey too. I'm maturing too. So, so, so I say that because I got all the equipment, but, you know. <laughs> I'm not listening to y'all right now. Listen, I'm talking. I hear y'all. Y'all say, y'all, you need to use it, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you so much for helping me. Thank you so much for helping me. So, so I, I say that because 
Because I have a secret place with the Lord every day. This morning, I got up at 4 o'clock this morning because I wasn't going to come here empty and not be able to give anything to you. Oh, let me help you. This message was created weeks ago. Uh, maybe I fine-tuned some things this week and asked the Lord to show me some things I need to communicate to you through the Word of God. But this is not a last-minute, uh, let me go to sermons.com and print something off and give it to you today. This is something that's in my heart that I believe the Holy Spirit gave to me to give to you as a, as a shepherd, as a pastor, that God's leading us together in this. And I'm not saying that I'm over here and you're down here. I'm saying we're in this journey together. But guess what? If you're going to be in the journey together, there's going to be a press. There, there's there, there's going to be a prize. There's going to be a reward. There's going to be there's going to be a mark. There's going to be a high calling. And in, 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 in that, Jesus got away. Jesus got away. Where's your secret place? Now watch this. In, in the next verse, here it is, Mark 1, 36, 39. Simon and, and the companions went looking for him. They can't find Jesus. Jesus is praying. He's, he's went away. He, he went away, and they're looking for him. Watch this. And when they found him, they, ex, they, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to a nearby village so I can preach there also. Why would Jesus say this? Because Jesus is not going to be driven by man's agenda. He's going to be driven by the Father's agenda. When you get, when you get with the Lord, the Lord gives you an agenda to walk out. So he's spending time with the Lord. He's spending time with the Father. Now he has this agenda that he was going to go to a nearby village. You know why? Because Jesus knew that the people that were looking for him wanted healing, but they didn't want the healer. Jesus knew they wanted miracles, but they didn't want the Messiah. They knew that Jesus, they wanted the things that Jesus could offer them, but they didn't really want who he was. So Jesus said, no, I'm not going to fool with that. Sometimes humanity, here's what we do. We sacrifice the important for the urgent. Okay. We sacrifice the important for the urgent. The important thing that God spoke to your spirit, spoke to your heart, is more important than the urgent thing that arises. What do I mean? There's some things that we can't control that we just need to trust God. This whole building project, it's a trust thing with God. I can't control what I can't control. I can't control city. I can't control city officials. I can't control state. I can't control uh, 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 utilities. I can't control what the cost of something is. I can't control. But what I can control is am I going to trust God or am I going to walk away from God? Am I going to know that God called us to do that, take territory? Or am I just going to throw my hands up and walk away and give up? No, I can't control everything. But what I can do, here's what I can do. I can keep the main thing the main thing and not let the urgent thing distract me from the important thing. Really hear me today. Because the enemy knows if he can make it urgent, he can have you get off the mark. And then you lose the prize of the high calling. Because guess what? Not everyone's emergency is really an emergency. Some people are driven by crowds, but Jesus was driven by the confidence, the commitment that the Father gave him. Everybody look at Pastor Jay, please. Look at me. I know I'm a new pastor. Well, new as a senior pastor right here to Elevate Life. I've been doing this for 28 years, but everybody look at me. I got two hands. <laughs> I got two hands. When I sat down with some really amazing men of God, they told me years ago, I want to help you. You only got two hands. There's only so many things you can actually do do. I'll never forget that because it was a season in my life that I wanted to be everything to everybody. But if you live for everything, you don't live at all. I realized that I can't be everything to everybody, but I can be what God's called me to be, to be a good pastor, to be a good leader, to be a good husband, to be a good man, to be a good father, to be a good friend, to fight for futures, to fight for you to win. I can be that. But if you want me to be something I'm not, and you try to force me into a box that I was never designed to fit in, you will be misled by your own ambitions and your own preferences that you will actually think that I'm the issue, not realizing that you're trying to put me somewhere that I was never called to be. Are you with what I'm trying to say? And that's what we do with people. We try to put people because we see something in them that we like, and we try to fit them in positions that we want them to fit in so they can play a part in our life. Can I just tell you something? As a pastor, my heart is for you to win. 
I want you to win. If you don't come to this church and you're not winning, then man, let's find a different church for you can win in. Because in this church, guess what? There is a press. There is a push. We are going to win. God will get the glory. We will see heaven crowded. We will see this state won. In this church, God will do the impossible. A $3 million build in two years. Who said it couldn't happen? So many people said it could happen. But I look back and we're on the tail end of it now. And I just thank God. I thank God for his grace that along the journey there was some pressing. There's been some stretching. There's been some weight carrying. Because listen, when you're a servant leader and you're a servant leader and you got a high calling, guess what? You care. And then you carry. And then you walk in confidence. But some people, they'll never care. So they'll never carry, and they'll never have the confidence that God instilled in them. And so what happens is, you say you care, but when you really care, guess what? You start carrying some weight. You start carrying a little bit different. No, my family's going to be changed. Those addicts are going to be changed in my family. We're breaking the poverty of generational curses. We're breaking, we're, 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 we're destroying, we're done. We're done. We're done with that negative thinking. We're done with the fighting in the house. We're done with the argument about money. We're done with who's going to have the final. We're done with that. We're going to lead and live the way God wants us to lead and live. The disciples were trying to tell Jesus to do something that he wasn't supposed to be doing. So Jesus had a place. He goes, I'll go to the villages and preach. I've come so that travel through Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Watch this. i got to close here. What's driving you? What's driving you? When I wake up in the mornings, here's the first thing in the morning. Number one, God, I want to be a better man. Number two, I want to be a better husband. Number three, I want to be a better father. Number four, I want to be a better pastor. That's my drive. That's the order of my drive. Why? Number one, I want to be the man that God's called me to be, man, the, the man that God's called me to be. Because if this relationship ain't right, none of this relationships will ever be right. Are you with me? If this relationship isn't right, none of my other relationships will ever be right. So God, I want to be the man that you call me to be. But then guess what? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his own soul? What does it profit for me to build this church and us to work together and we build it together, but I lose my own family along the journey? What does it profit anybody to lose the very thing that God's given you as a gift? That woman sitting on the front row has been a gift to me for 25 years, for 26 years. And I'm not going to lose that gift. I'm not going to lose that gift over what God has put in my heart. Because my first and foremost ministry is to my family. Are you with me, church? I'm just sharing my heart with you a little bit right now. My second is my sons. I got two sons here. They work every day in this church. They work every day here. They serve every day. And this is not a family deal, even though my family's here. We got other people that are not family. But this is, this is a place where I want my sons to develop the heart and the heart for God and the heart for a community and the heart for people. Because we live in a world where it's really selfish today. We live in a world today where everybody's looking out for them. And we got people that are dying and going to a place called hell, literally going to a place called hell, that one word from us could change the trajectory of their whole entire life if we would be encouraging, if we would be loving. And instead, we, don't, we, we walk around with crunch face, and we got Jesus on the inside of us. We shouldn't have crunch face and have Jesus on the inside of us. That's why it's called self-leadership. i got to lead myself. You guess what? The Bible says a man that doesn't lead himself well is like a city with his walls torn down. So when I lead myself well, guess what? I'm protected. My daddy used to tell me this, and my dad's a preacher. My dad's a pastor. He says, listen, have a tender heart but thick skin. Have a tender heart but thick skin. But you know you can be in church for a long time, and you can get a, you can get a, you can get a thick heart. And you can miss what God wants to do because you've been hurt. Can I just tell you something? There's not a perfect church out there. The moment I walked in, the moment you walked in, the church became unperfect. Hello, somebody. But guess what? Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his mercy that picks us right back up and dusts off our knees and keeps us going. So I say that because there's an order to way to live, to press. My press is towards God. Then watch this. My second press, here it is, towards my wife, my best friend. Then my third press is towards my children. And then my fourth press is to be the best I can be for you. That's the heart of what I got. And then there's other things, but what's driving you? This is what wakes me up. Watch this. Watch this. Now, here's the end of the story. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, if you are willing, if you are willing, if you are willing, how many know God's always willing? How many know we got to ask? 
The Bible says in John 14, 14, if you ask anything in his name, he'll do it. Watch this. If you, if, if you can make me clean, then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, touched him, and said to him, I'm willing, be cleansed. And as soon as he spoke, immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. What, what's the whole story? What's the whole story? Watch this. Here's the third point. Are you willing to do what you've never done? What do you mean? Let me give you context as I close. Old Testament law, Old Testament law, Jesus is in the New Testament. Old Testament law says if you had a, a, an ailment, if you had an illness, if you had leprosy, you had to be away from somebody 50 paces. Watch this, 50 paces. Some of the, you, you read that, you didn't understand maybe context yet. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's ten. 50 paces. If I had leprosy and you were coming near me in 50 paces, I have to scream, unclean, unclean, stay away, unclean, unclean. I got leprosy, unclean, unclean, don't get near me, unclean, unclean. Let me help you. Humanity will always call out your condition, but God sees your identity. Listen to me, listen to me. God sees who you're called to be, not who you are walking in. God sees something great. So he is crying out, unclean. But when he sees Jesus, he's willing to do something he's never done. Guess what he does? The Bible says he walks towards Christ and he kneels down. And he said, if you are willing, would you make me clean? And Jesus spoke, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately when the Lord spoke, the Bible says immediately when he spoke, guess what? He was cleansed. He could have got stoned. He could have been put to death because he broke the old covenant law. Because he came in close of 50 paces. He came too near. He was unclean. I think about my own life. I was unclean. But thank God for his grace. Thank God I came towards him saying, Jesus, I'm broken, I'm hurting, I'm, I've been abused, I've been misled, I've been mistreated, I come from a broken family of addicts, but God, I need you in my life to do something that only you can do. And I knelt down before him, and he changed my life forever. Can I just tell you something? That's the grace of God. That's the mercy of God. God wants to do that in your family. God wants you to win. God wants you to have everything in your life, your heart's desire. God doesn't want you just to survive life, but God wants you to thrive in life. God wants you to have those things that he's instilled in you, those dreams, those visions. God wants those to come to pass, but guess what? You're going to have to do something you've never done before. You're going to have to press. You're going to have to be in a secret place. You're going to have to have the right motivation, the right drive, because if you don't get the right drive and the right motivation, You'll be misled and you'll think you'll work your whole life for a platform that didn't really matter at the end of your life. Can I tell you something? The only reason I'm in Connecticut, it's because there was a God in heaven that sent me and my wife here 20 months ago. There's no other reason why I'm here. I'm not here on my own accord. I'm here. God sent me here. God sent me here to build up people, to encourage people, to help people win. I'm not here for me because if I was here for me, I'd be in Dallas, Texas. If I was here for me, I would be living in my old house. If I was here for me, I would be with my own friend group. But I'm here because I believe that God's called me here. I believe that God's called you here. Maybe it might not be forever. And I want to let you know, if you ever decide to transition out of our church, we're never going to beat you up about it. We're going to bless you out. We're going to love you. We're going to celebrate you. We're going to tell you you're a champion and go be it planted somewhere else. We're not that kind of church that says if you leave us, you're never going to be blessed. Can I just tell you something? That's demonic. That's evil. That's not God's heart. That's not God's motives. God wants you to get planted because when you're planted, you flourish. You get, you get stronger. But let me tell you something. Our church is we believe in you. We're going to help you. You ain't got to be perfect to come here. You, you can have tattoos, you can have piercings, you can have purple hair, blue hair, yellow hair, no hair. You can be like me. I, I don't care. We're going to love you and we're going to help you. It might not be God's best for your life, but we're going to believe that God's going to pull you out of whatever mess you're in. And he's going to set your feet on a solid foundation. And that God's going to get all the glory at the end of your life. We're never going to beat you up. But I promise you, you will be built up. 
And you will feel healthy tension on your life to grow because at the end of our life, we got to grow. We got to mature. I got to get close to Jesus. I got some things in my life that are unclean. I got to get close to Him. I'm not talking about me. I'm just saying there's things that, that I make mistakes just like you do. But we got to come low, God. Help me. But you got to be willing to show it. You'll never be healed by what you keep revealed. And what you keep hidden, hidden will remain hidden as long as you keep it hidden. But the moment I open it up and say, God, you can have that. Because I'm done. I've been pressing the wrong way. I want to press towards the right things of life. I want to win in life. And I'm going to pray over you today and I want you to win. I believe this is a message from God this morning. I believe this is a message from the Holy Spirit that God wants you to know that you are his champion in the middle of a sauna this morning. God wants you to know that guess what? That's why the Bible says, let go of the sin that so eagerly, uh, 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 easily entangles us. Let it go. Sweat it out. <laughs> and let's move forward. Father, today I pray for every person in this room. I pray, God, right now that you would speak to every individual. Holy Spirit, we ask you in this moment right now that you would reveal what we need to press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling towards Jesus Christ. Father, we're, what, 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 what areas of our life are we pressing in the wrong direction? What areas of our life are we going in the wrong way? I pray, God, that we would develop that secret place. I pray, God, that we would be driven by the right things. And I pray, God, we'll be willing to do whatever it takes, whatever, whatever we need to do, that we'll be willing to do that. I pray today, God, that you would show yourself faithful today. If you're in this place and you say, hey, pastor, I, I got to get my life right with the Lord. I got to get my life right. If that's you today, I want you to just to simply raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you. If you're in this room today and you say, my life is not 100. I'm not living my best life. I'm not living the way I know I need to be living. I, I need Jesus to be Lord and Savior of my life. I need Jesus to be my God. I need Jesus to cleanse me of all my unrighteousness and be my Lord. If that's you today, simply raise your hand high. I want to pray for you right now. Just slip it up high real quick, real quick. If that's you, I want you to get out of your seat right now and just come to the altar real quick. If that's you, get out of your seat and come to the altar real quick. Just real quick, real quick, real quick. I'm going to pray for you quickly. Don't wait, don't wait. Don't wait for somebody else to come. If you raise your hand, you walk down here and you do what what God's told you to do. Come on, just come, come quickly. I'm gonna pray for you quickly, quickly. Just you know, you can stand, you can stand, you can stand. I, I love that your guys is honor for the Lord. Just stand because I'm gonna pray over you very quickly. Come on, come on, come on, church. Let's give them a hand clap as they come. Let's give them a hand clap. Come on, come on, you guys come this way, come this way, come this way. Come on, I believe this is for you today. Come on, I believe this is for you today. Come on, I believe that God's got something for you. Come on, come on. God's so proud of you, man. I'm so proud of you, man. God bless you, man. God bless you. I'm so proud of you guys. So proud of you guys. Hey, family, stretch your hands towards these people right now. Stretch your hands towards these people. God loves you today. I want you to know that. God's got something in store for you. He's got a great future for you. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't walk away. Don't throw the towel in. Don't grow weary. Just stay the course. Go after the mark. Father, I pray for every single person that came forward today. I thank you, Lord God, for their step of obedience, their step of faith to know you greater. I pray, God, today that your hand will be upon them. I want everyone in this room to say this with me. Say, dear Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross, and you rose again. Today, I repent of my sins. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I invite you to be Lord of my life to every area, every area. Thank you, Jesus for saving my soul. Thank you, Jesus, for redeeming my life. I believe that the best is yet to come. My life will be an example for others to follow. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap. Come on.